Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth of a series of webinars entitled AI Talks at the ETUI. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo, and today I'm your host. We have a special guest, uh, Benedetta Brevini. Benedetta, mm -hmm. she is an associate professor in the political and economy of communications at the Sydney, University of Sydney. So thank you, Benedetta, for coming all the way from Sydney. Thank you. She is also a visiting fellow at the Centre for Law, Justice and Journalism at the City University London and research associate at the Central European University. Bernadetta is not just a very successful academic, she has also been trained as a journalist and author a number of books, like, for example, Public Service Broadcasting Online, and she was the editor of the acclaimed volume Beyond Wikileaks. She also wrote more environmental uh, related uh, publications just like Carbon Capitalism and communicate, Communication, Confronting the Climate Crisis, Amazon Understanding a Global Communication Giant, and the latest one, Is AI Good for the Planet? And this is why she is here uh, with all her big background and experience all the way from Australia to our screens. And uh, welcome, Benedetta. And our starting point is artificial intelligence. So how would you define it? Please Absolutely. So thank you, thank you, Aida, for the invitation, and also thank you to the European Trade Union Institute for the opportunity. And I think that actually, just before starting our conversation on a definition of artificial intelligence and trying to find a definition, I think that it's important just to very quickly like um, understand the debate that in the context that we are experiencing. Like some scholars have been talking about a situation of limit that we are witnessing at the moment. But I think that for a, for a European audience, it could be very important to just start with the latest communication published by the European Commission that has been entitled the Strategic Foresight um, like a report and twinning the green and the digital transition in the new geopolitical context. Now, I think that this is very important because once again, we see the European Commission involved in reinstating the relevance of the green together with the digital transition. And I think that these two um, very important moments, paradigmatic moments that have been br like brought together by this communication are really the starting point for my research, for the book, and also for the need to really understand and find the right definition to artificial intelligence. Because on the one hand, we have this incredible investment that started in Europe and beyond Europe, of course, after the pandemic with a major EU budget, you know, 1.8, almost 1.8 trillion um, of euros. And on the other hand, we have the biggest crisis that the planet has ever faced. And for the first time now, we also know that compared to five years ago, we know that the crisis is even worse than what we expected. Because we know that if we don't act quickly in trying to reduce by 50% the carbon emission that we currently have, we are going to be failing in our major quest to keep the temperature level to the 1.5% famously agreement, agreed upon uh, with Paris. So then on the one end, again, we have this incredible reliance on technology that has been exacerbated through the pandemic. And we also have AI that is considered crucial for the recovery. On the other hand, we have this major climate crisis. And I mean, the, one of the major drive of my work in the last 10 years has been precisely trying to see why these two fora are so distant and how and what we can do to bring these two arena, the technological policy debate with the environmental debate much closer to one another. And um, I think that in order to do that, and this is why your question about define AI is so important, is that very often in mainstream debates, we come to really think of artificial intelligence in a different way 
So we, we tend to consider um, a, a definition of artificial intelligence as the divine hand, as you know, the tool that can help us create and, a pro and, uh, and solve all the major calamities that we are facing as a world. So capitalism is in crisis, artificial intelligence will sort it out. The climate is, is a major emergency, AI will sort it out. We have a pandemic, AI will contribute to help. And in this way, this magical thinking that I really call the tech sublime um, is not really helping addressing the real problems, is very often obfuscating the major problems around inequalities, the major exploitation of workers, the major um, contemporary social issues that are very linked to the crisis, to the limit situation we're facing. So, um, we saw that this mythical thinking that has led us to always consider AI uh, with a definition that looked at AI as the tool to sort out the problems we have, the tool to save us in a way, is something that is absolutely not new in uh, previous debates, not new in literature, not new when we consider the development of new technologies. And this is where definitions of AI, in my view, failed to really connect and to offer a very good framework to try to understand and address the current climate crisis that we're facing. And this is why a typical definition, a typical popular definition of artificial intelligence, such as this one that I just, uh, um, uh, I have here in my slide, have proven not to be so beneficial. Because you know, to understand AI as the ability of machine to mimic and to perform our cognitive functions, you know, like replace humans, be better than humans, is not really helping understanding in what ways AI is connected to the climate emergency we're facing. Why is not? Well, you know, precisely because of the mythical thinking, the magic, the sublime phase attached to it, you know, instead of looking at what is really AI, we are often considering the AI as this artificial tool that will help us as, you know, the ability for, you know, to mimic um, human, con human cognitive functions. And so I looked and it took me a long time, believe me, even trying to find an agreements with AI developers and agreements with engineers, uh, computer scientists, trying to find the right definition of AI. And by looking for definitions, I actually have to say that um, one of the earlier definitions used, for example, in the EU white paper on artificial intelligence was starting going in the right direction because finally we see AI defined as a collection of technology. So we really see that the EU here is making an effort to try to establish their very important link between the technologies and also the data capitalism that is, you know, um, uh, characterizing the kind of huge development that we've seen in AI in the last decade and algorithms and computing powers. And in this way, we start reclaiming and being approaching and being able to reclaim a more material definition of AI, which is, you know, to answer your question, the kind of definition that I thought we were really in need of. And like in my uh, discipline, of course, like taking a perspective that really looks at the political, economic, social factors impinging, then we can understand AI as assemblages of technologies, as machines, as infrastructures. And once we are able to reclaim AI in this way, then we are able to really understand it in terms of the resource, in, ter in terms of the energy, in terms of the materials that are absolutely crucial for AI to become you know, um, relevant in our way in addressing the climate crisis and also to try to really finally place the development of these technologies in connection with the climate crisis. The problem is that once we start doing this, once we start really addressing the problems and we start like um, um, getting rid of the mythical, the sublime thinking about AI, and we stop thinking of AI just as the divine hand that will save the world, then the problems start emerging because of course we have to start considering 
the assemblages of technologies, the collection of technologies in the words of the European um, EU um, draft act as you know, the machines and infrastructures and of course, precisely because they are machines and infrastructures, then they create environmental problems. How they create environmental problems in their energy consumption, in their emissions, but also in the material toxicity that is associated with it. And of course, in the electronic waste, which is all connected to the um, chain of production. And I use the word tech colonialism, borrowing, of course, from you know various work, you know, starting with you know Nicole Dremeheas um, data colonialism, and also you know the work of um, Mirka Modiano on tech colonialism. But the essential character, you know, of tech colonialism is to keep perpetrating the same kind of um, violence, if you will, on the communities on the, um, the you know, less, uh, to use a word uh, that is quite common, the less developed countries, just as it happened in the past. In other way, there was always a continuity, you know, in the kind of exploitation that also tech colonialism is exhibiting. And so in order, you know, to show what really are the environmental costs of AI is not enough as you know, the current communication of the European Commission has done to mention the fact that, yes, in a very short paragraph, there are some problems and some environmental arms that are connected to the energy consumption of AI. Yes, of course, that's major, but we need to really cross and check the entire the entire um, um, like chain of production of the assemblages of technologies and machines that enable the sort of AI developments that we've been seeing. So in the book, if you're interested in the book and in, in exploring all of these more in details, of course, I give a lot of examples, but just briefly to give you an idea, we need to start with the raw materials. So we need to start with the extractivism of this type of technologies that are of course not artificial, but highly material, and they're based on raw materials. Now, the same uh, communication and the same uh, report that is based on the communication by the European Commission acknowledges that the use of lithium in the US, in the EU, for example, will be increasing by 3,500%. I mean, these are numbers that should make us really think because as you will see, of course, it's not, this is just the beginning of the kind of environmental cost of AI, right? Starting just from the beginning of the, the kind of extractionism that AI entails. And I have just a, a case study from Chile and uh, you know others from Mexico because Chile is one of the second largest lithium producer. And of course, you know, we know the kind of battles that environmental activists had to endure, the kind of dispossession of indigenous lands and the kind of environmental cost associated with this kind of extractionism. But of course, this is only the starting point, right? So we need to move to another crucial um, component of AI that has been a bit debated in the media. Um, and, uh, and it's due to the fabulous work that was done by colleagues at the University of Massachusetts Amherst at the end of 2019, because despite the multiple challenges to measure the computational power of training a general algorithm, they managed, and in my view, this is why this work is very important to actually show us um, and give us a rough idea of what we're talking about here, a rough idea of the kind of energy that is necessary to train a very basic kind of language application, AI language application. And once for the first time I saw the data, I actually couldn't really believe it because I was in shock and I had to have, you know, five engineers um, that are experts in computational uh, power of neural networks to explain this to me. So what I did, I tried really to, um, to draw comparisons and I tried to make this data, in my view, more accessible. And you see this table as a result of the work I've done trying to make sense, because when we think of a typical uh, flight that we are told we shouldn't be taken, right? Because we should always prefer a train ride from London to Rome. And we see that the, the carbon emission 
of a train London to Rome would be 234 kilograms. And then we are told that the training of a natural language processing AI application would in entail, in fact, something like 284,000 of kilograms of carbon emission, then we see the extent of the problem that we're facing. And, uh, and I think that actually, if I told you, yes, because uh, on average, a natural language processing system will produce 284,000 of carbon emission, you probably would have thought, okay, that seems a lot, but what does it mean? But when you are faced with comparison, and then we understand the huge issue you know, that we're facing. And we can, of course, open a debate because there are ways to address this massive computational problem. But what I'm, I keep repeating to engineers when they, they tell me, yes, we're getting there, we're trying to make neural networks more sustainable, I'm always, always repeating, yes, but we don't have much time. So when is this going to happen? Because that's our problem at the moment. We know also through the extent of the weather events that we're constantly facing every day in this European summer, for example, like the kind of problem we're facing. So now moving on in the, um, in the chain um, of production, of course, we have probably the most debated of the issues that are connected to AR, which is the power of data center and the kind of energy that is needed you know, to make sure that the data centers are performing. And of course, you know, the kind of terawatt of hours and the energy usage of big data centers. So this is, of course, and indeed a problem that is also mentioned frequently in policy documents that I've seen, you know, being distributed uh, within European debates. But of course, it's not just the energy consumption, it's also the water consumption. And if you go on the average, you know, website of DeepMind, you will see that they are acknowledging that the cooling of the system is creating major issues. We also know that companies have been constantly declaring that they're working on it and they're trying to do their best to make them data centers more sustainable. Again, we need to keep pushing. We need to keep this type of discourse because we are not there yet. You know, just similarly to the type of um, sustainability of the neural networks that are still not sustainable enough. And then something that is completely neglected in the discourses around the development of technologies, we need to dispose of this type of technologies. Now, disposing of the waste is again, in my view, another great example of the way in which tech colonialism is at work. Because unfortunately, if I told you what is one of the capital in the world of e-waste, you'll see that it's Nairobi, the outskirts of Kenya. So why is it that we're dumping this type of very highly toxic um, electronic materials to Kenya? Because they don't have the kind of regulations that we have. And uh, of course, you know, it's getting easier than to, you know, to, to just say, well, we pay for the transport and then, you know, uh, these countries, again, you know, where the conditions of the workers are not, you know, absolutely similar, uh, where, you know, the people that are actually working in this disposal can get sick, the, the, the soil, the land can get highly polluted and, you know, we are still doing and we are still actually perpetrating this type of violence towards these developing countries. So, but again, in the chain of production, you know, the, the bit of disposal very often gets overlooked. But this is really also due to the kind of data capitalism, the kind of en en constant encouragement to consume and to produce more without the possibility, for example, to recycle more or, you know, with a, a little bit now, finally, of a recognition of the right to repair that should lead to less, you know, e-waste. And, uh, and I think that this is a very good step in the right direction. So this is really just to give you an idea of the kind of environmental cost. And, and I think that what is really important is to really try to re-understand and reclaim this material definition of AI, because without the material definition of AI, then it's almost impossible to make AI really green and actually try to address this major problem of sustainability, because we could not just address the issue of the neural networks or the issue of the data centers, we need a complete and a holistic, really, like a policy toolkit that considers a variety of interventions there. And I want to conclude with one of my favorite examples 
of where, for example, as a society, I think we are failing in precisely recognizing the kind of climate calamity that we are witnessing, because you know the kind of AI applications that have been offered to the fossil fuels industry are increasing, and the profits of AI companies are increasing. And this is really the kind of application that I would have wanted to see completely banned in you know a AI Act for example, um, because you know, they carry very high risk, right? And um, so I hope that we can start you know, from this definition and from the cost uh, with the conversation. I'm very happy to answer your questions. This has been a fantastic uh, starting point, Benedetta. Uh, you have put an, into the table, not only the, material, the necessity of material definition, but you have just unveiled everything that is behind the supply chain of how AI is, is constructed and delivered and just disposed. So sometimes things that we don't really care about or what we don't even know, uh, it depends on what type of values we have as uh, citizens, consumers, workers. And speaking about values, the ones, the two values that are put forward, at least in Europe or sometimes across the world, is transparency and accountability of AI. And I haven't heard about putting sustainability as a, also a value in creating and producing and disposing AI, which I think it's a pity. But I would like to have your point of view. Are, do you know if some policymakers across the world in any country are looking at these sustainability aspects at the whole of the supply chain on their um, narratives to construct policy? Do you have some examples or ideas? Yes, no, I think I have a lot of ideas and I've been giving similar talks uh, in different contexts, uh, also in the Asia Pacific, for example. And uh, I can tell you that um, the um, different policymakers are at work in trying to secure compliance checks that, of course, going in, in the direction of trying to reach out more transparency. But I haven't seen uh, clear work done in, in trying to really push more accountability and transparency in the variety you know, of uh, the different um, supply chain and um, production chain of you know, AI applications. Now, I have to say um, that the debate uh, in Europe around the AI Act in my view at the moment is one of the most vibrant because we see, for example, that the idea of having the so-called databases of AI application, you know, in my view could become really the best instrument to constantly check and also for the public and for the workers working in this industry to try really to understand um, the, and, 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 and check really, because it's, a, it's gonna become a public, um, a public database that everybody and civil society groups and citizens could possibly access. And access. The problem is um, that whenever I'm uh, proposing um, new ideas, so I think that you know, the way in which I, I structured the presentations, trying to really um, highlight the different processes that are involved, is the, very promising in a way that we could demand the kind of um, independent authority check on the type of compliance of each of the phases. Now, I know that whenever we have a conversation like this in Europe, then regulators are starting worrying who is going to do that, how much it's going to cost. Because of course we know that when we talk about um, you know compliances, um, there is a, a huge issue around the cost. But I don't think we have um, other ways to really address these major problems. Why? Because a lot of these processes, simply because we let the development of AI uh, being pushed by major global corporations, and if you look at the book, you'll see who are the major big stakeholders. You know, I call them digital lords because I feel that the term platform is not good enough to explain the kind of um, unaccountable power they hold, not just uh, power to develop tech and AI, but also the political power to really impose the kind of, you know, ethical framework that for many years has made us really stuck in this idea that the only 
options you know, that we could have even in Europe were to self-regulate. Well, it's not the case. We know that we could actually intervene in the public interest. And I think that the climate crisis is making the public interest in a way more narrow because we really don't have much time. If we keep building data centers in area of drought where you know, they need massive amounts of water, uh, we know by itself that it's completely unsustainable. Like we know already when we talk to engineers working in, for example, in um, Kenya or in Chile, I was just in Mexico doing a similar presentation. They don't have the right infrastructures to run complex AI systems as we conceive them in the US, in China and in Europe. So what, are the, what can they do? They're gonna be completely left out from this race. Right. And so and uh, what about the workers, for example, what about the citizens? And so these are really crucial issues that we should really ask. But I think that there are ways, for example, to highlight. So now I can tell you that there are a few companies that are developing, for example, in the UK, but also in Europe, and they're trying to start selling um, their um, you know, measurements of the different uh, section of the value chain in the production of AI. So they're starting as a business. I think that in order to guarantee proper public accountability, we should have these checks, you know, completely like uniformed at the European level. And we should, you know, aim for more transparency. And, um, and I think that starting from there would be incredibly promising because we are able to say, okay, this um, device has been, pro, you know, has been um, created uh, with a, a specific type of uh, um, neural networks that has, you know, that needed this type of computational power. And of course, it's powered in this area that uses 70% of fossil fuels in terms of their electricity grid. So we are able to make these assessments. And then we're able also to see, and the cost to dispose these technologies, you know, and the transport for disposal are such and such. Because as citizens, accepting that AI is going to take decisions that we were supposed, you know, to also take, well, it's a necessity. So I don't think it's something that we can postpone any longer. Thank you, Benedetta. And uh, you have given a lot of uh, input and indeed uh, shown that AI is pushed by major digital lords, as you just coined, with an accountable power on tech, on ethics, on standards, on policy. Uh, a big question. Do you think that AI is increasing inequalities? Um, well, unfortunately, uh, the, the best question, the best answer to this is that, so AI is perpetrating the same kind of inequalities. So the same kind of social, political and economic inequalities we have, you know, so again, technology is always in a full sense social. Technology is not a tool that gets developed and can save us, right? It's something that together as a collective of people, we decide to shape. Now, the fact that AI has been developed in the last decade as, um, as a, a sort of a tool that has been appropriated by big digital lords is something that we accepted. I'm always explaining in, uh, in talks that if the development of AI had been pushed in the 40s, for example, just after World War II, where the big um, communication system were developing, we would have probably considered it too important to leave it only to the market. It happened with all major European public service broadcasters, for example, that have been you know, conceived and in the Amsterdam Protocol as part really of our fundamental rights. You know, it didn't happen with AI, why? Because the kind of data capitalism, the kind of tech colonialism that we've been let build in the last 10 years have seen the, the social, you know, of technology being appropriated by this type of development. But we could have chosen, you know, to go down a different route and we could have decided that AI was too important to leave the major decisions to the market. Now, um, in terms of the inequality, again, 
like it's perpetrating the same kind of inequalities, yes. But what I see is that in the, in the violence of tech colonialism and in the incredible rootless um, continuous kind of data extractionism, I see inequalities on the rise. I see people losing jobs. I see people not having the skills to participate in this. I see people in the global south being completely cut off by these incredible uh, new opportunities to profit, right, out of AI. Because we're talking really about a new way to profit out of something. And when we talk about efficiencies, very often efficiencies are great efficiencies for the business that are leading to profit. But what about the workers? The workers are left behind. If they're losing their jobs, we don't have a plan B. Um, and we know already that a lot of these systems are faulty. So we know that then we will need the kind of curation. You know, Frank Pasquale is constantly talking also about this idea of also curating, you know, together with humans and AI systems. Why? Because we need to constantly check also on the systems, but we also need to create a society that tries. Now, this is also why, for example, only aiming for sustainability and sustainability as a word, I'm really not a fan of this word either, because unfortunately it's, you know, as a society, we don't need only to be sustainable. We need to thrive. So we need to like make sure that sustainable is really not enough, right? We need to make sure that we can address the kind of emergencies that we're facing. And so we need to do more. And yes, unfortunately, the kind of um, um, in a, in a unequal, unequal um, data capitalism we are seeing, data capitalism that is driving AI is incrementing inequalities. And we see this every day. The right to disconnect doesn't exist. Thank you for this very specific statement, Benedetta. Uh, and uh, as, as some of uh, the big players are profiting of something, are they using also AI, AI as a corporate social responsibility measure? Unfortunately, um, I'm sure that you've seen already applied in many instances um, the way in which um, there are um, major data brokers, for example, or new companies coming into the market and claiming that AI is can be considered again, you know, this, the, the usual um, um, identification of AI as a tool to address climate change. So the, the way in which they promise to address these issues is the usual one. So the tools are always the same. We can reduce the carbon emission through tracking, so the idea of we track the activities of the company and we reduce the carbon emission, the idea of creating the so-called forecast simulation and forecasting, you know, of the type, again, of consumption. And so we can lead to more efficiencies in the kind of um, forecasting that we are doing. And then, of course, um, very often we talk about the visualization and the production and consumption um, that changes, you know, the sectors and can lead to environmental um, um, savings. Um, like the issue is that whenever you read such claims, you always see that none of these claims ever considers what we precisely discussed in the last 10, 15 minutes, which is, you know, one, can we really claim that these are the kind of efficiency to reduce the carbon emission when the type of products that we are going to be using has such a huge carbon emission and such a huge environmental impact? So it's always a trade-off, right? It's always a balance. You know, can we really demonstrate that this is the case, or we completely again? by embracing a definition that doesn't look at the materiality and environmental harm of AI, we are just claiming that AI will save us. I'm actually inclined to think that this is part of the same kind of discourse. It's a kind of discourse, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated, I'm very curious to see also um, what, you know, your colleagues and uh, the public will have to say about this. But I'm always, I'm very intrigued. And when the European Commission published um, the communication, I found it incredibly extraordinary because for the first time, they really make very clear the connection between the green and the technology, um, even more so than in the past, in the last five years. But 
it's only a very small paragraph in which they acknowledge, and I'm very pleased that finally, at least we have an acknowledgement that everything would need to be mitigated by the consideration of the kind of environmental harm that technology and digital can bring to the planet. But again, when we are marketing, you know, through greenwashing, um, because unfortunately, um, uh, corporate social responsibility often in the case of the environment becomes greenwashing and we are marketing these services. Unfortunately, we see that there is none consideration, no consideration done to the kind of environmental cost of AI. So I would like to see these um, services being sold to companies after a proper environmental assessment of the cost of the target technologies that they're selling and only then reassess to see if we can really talk about an advantage. And this links me to uh, uh, perhaps the final question before we open the floor to the questions from the public. Um, so you have spoken in, at the very beginning of the foresight uh, communication of the European Commission, yeah. and also a little bit about the AI Act. Uh, two big communications that might have a very thin link one, putting environmental and AI together uh, as a responsibility from policymakers, and the other one, the AI Act, not addressing it at all. So <laughs> uh, also you have spoken about the benefits of uh, databases uh, of the services and products uh, produced with AI or uh, driven by AI systems. So the question is, Benedetta, for the policymakers who might be listening or for those who are interested in policy, what is your opinion of the EU approach in regulating artificial intelligence? Well, I have to say that um, having followed the debate very closely, um, I was uh, happy to see at least uh, um, some great uh, um, you know, steps be made away for the only ethical framework that we saw at the very beginning. And uh, the discourse also being led towards a rights-based approach. So of course, you know, from uh, um, my background and in political economy and in law, of course, I'm in favor of a rights-based approach to AI. And, uh, and one that obviously considers the type of safeguards that we need, the type of, you know, accountability that we need. And, um, and at the moment, for me, it is really incredible that in the AI Act, we don't have any mention of the environmental um, rights being violated um, as a result of AI. It could have been easy really to consider it. And I saw the submission, for example, of Algorithm Watch. I saw the submission of colleagues, for example, from the Center for Nonprofit uh, uh, Law um, in, um, in Brussels. And they are claiming, and of course, that there the needs to be more attention you know, to the kind of environmental costs that I debated here. Um, I actually, um, I think that the idea of the risk-based approach that the AI Act um, adopted um, is useful when, for example, they list very clearly the type of, um, you know, detrimental high risk applications that cannot really be developed. And of course, um, they subject to regulation that ones who are at high risk, but the problem is what they leave out. And of course, you know, this is something that I can see generating also the, you know, European Parliament um, level, a huge debate, but also with intervention of the civil society. Now, um, for me to see the way in which the biometric uh, interventions and, um, you know, all the biometric mass surveillance applications having so many exemptions to the rule, for me, this is one of the biggest problems. And, uh, you know, after we have seen something like 32 states already in the US, for example, banning this type of applications, after seeing the kind of constant violation, for example, the application by China and the surveillance of the Uyghur um, communities, you know, we have so many case studies and examples of this type of application being in violation of fundamental rights of citizens that I'm surprised of the list of exemptions to this. The other big issue that I see that should be debated is um, the fact that I'm you know, inclined to think, and I can see from the debate that is going on now, national security will be left outside. 
So national security on the one hand, and also military operation. You know, why is that? Why do we want to leave something, especially that has been so controversial? You know that I have a book on WikiLeaks. You know that I've been working on uh, NSA revelations and the work of Snowden. Like, how could we leave national security outside? What's really the reason and why, you know, uh, member states at the moment seem to be so inclined to protect, you know, their decisions making? We like are like legislating for Europe and this is something that should be debated at the European level and not left to each state uh, to decide. The other major issue, and as you can see, I could be speaking about this for hours, but for me, the other major issue is at the compliance level. Um, a lot of the compliance is left to some sort of self, you know, and self-regulation. As a lawyer, I'm not a fan of self-regulation. I never was. I saw very often it doesn't really work. And this is too relevant to citizens to you know, not make sure that we have accountability. So this is why I think that the register of the AI application is a, a first good step, but the uniformity and uh, you know, at the European level of the kind of um, you know, compliance systems uh, that should be done by independent authorities really that are connected um, in Europe I think that should be really the starting point. And that is something that I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm not clear how it's going to be developed. Um, but of course, um, seeing that, so in my view, um, Aida, like if you study the history of technology and the history of data-driven communication systems being developed in the last decade, you will see how crucial in policy debates this, these tools have been considered, and then you see that um, welfare states have progressively abandoned you know, their power in developing the sort of public policy that was very crucial in determining the shape, you know, technology as social. So in deciding to what extent you know, we could shape uh, these new technologies. Um, I think that the privatization of this space and the privatization of this type of communication policy is very dangerous. And it's not just with AI, but with every kind of new you know, digital um, space. When we talk about developing communications policy, which is public policy, we also talk about the public interest. So we place the public interest first. Public interest has always been, you know, if you will, an, a concept not very easy to define, even in Europe. But we know that there are some rights and we have the charter that is there to assist us. While the charter also gives us the possibility to interpret these rights, including the environment, including the right to nature. And I think that this is, this is what we should be really doing, finally placing the climate emergency as a crucial aspect of the public interest and act on this. And, and this should be considered at the level of the AI Act. And I really hope that with the amendments, we'll get there. Hashtag me too. And I cannot be more <laughs> in accordance with you. And um, I will take a couple of questions from the chat, uh, Benedetta, if, you, if I may. And one is related to the training of the neural networks. And here, Christopher Attar, he asks, is the training of these neural network a continuous process? And what about the cost versus the benefits of AI when compared with the cost of energy consumption and the impact of the environment? And can you say something about, about that, Benedetta? Yes, Christopher, I can, I can tell you that I basically asked uh, a few engineers and AI, develop, AI developers a very similar question. Now, um, what I saw is that um, like there, is, there are groups of study, even in Brussels, for example, but also in Canada, um, I can see also in um, upstate New York, for example, Cornell, they are really working towards um, the um, like the reduction of the kind of um, you know massive energy cost of the neural networks at the moment. We have studies done that already show that even in the last, uh, I would say between 2015 and 20, the escalation has, has been unprecedented. But we also see that, for example, in the last two years, there are new experiments going on that could really address the type of, um, the type of energy consumption that we have. Now, this is as, as a background. Um, like, 
it's always difficult, right, to compare the kind of benefits to the users with the kind of energy consumption. But I can tell you that, for example, the reason why we need this kind of conversation now is that if we manage to keep pushing these corporations to reduce and to make these neural networks more sustainable, then of course we can start seeing the kind of benefits you know, that consumers or citizens can have. But at the moment, the, 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 the level of the massive energy consumption is so high. And in the context of the war, where still, you know, in, in times of you know, energy crisis, we are not pushing enough towards only renewable, but we are considering even, you know, digging more, even using more coal and fracking more, you know, this has major consequences to the electricity grid, because at the moment, according to the World Energy Outlook, like you have, we still have in the world about 67%, 67% of the electricity grid is based on fossil fuels. So where do we go from there? Even if you're producing the best of the neural network, uh, you know, if we don't push this type of corporations to demand that they are not only you know, connected to the electricity grid, then we really cannot address the major issues. But we are talking about massive numbers. We're not just talking about a flight between Rome and New York. So you know, let's keep this in mind. And of course, why um, the reason why I'm arguing for more transparency and accountability in the different phases is precisely to establish this, you know, to precisely to establish the kind of trade-off because we know that we are not going to give up uh, everything we achieved. But there could be, you know, a, a, an instance where, for example, working um, not constantly on the cloud could actually help consumer citizens save in terms of the energy consumption we use to be writing off the cloud. Now it seems to be almost impossible, but the environmental impact of the cloud, the environmental impact of the data center is massive at this point, and we have reached the situation of the limit. So again, these are all trade-offs that you know, um, we should consider. And, and I think that the time is really now pushing our limits. And uh, I would like to link uh, this, this response from you, Benedetta, with another uh, question related to the, to the change, the supply chain, and from consumption to waste disposal. And here I would like to bring about the question from Kevin Rogers, where he asks you that, um, that as you have stated, there are waste products from the tech industry that are being dumped in countries that cannot handle that waste because they don't have the infrastructure to do that. So are you, Benedetta, implying that, that AI is the largest community producing the most carbon waste? Should that industry not take responsibility for the environmental inequalities that they have helped to create? Absolutely. Yes, they should. But I think that we know that the industry will not take responsibility until policymakers will, you know, make the industry take responsibility. Why is that? Because the major developments of AI applications at the moment is in the hands of the same digital lords that often are actually capturing um, policy decision making. Like, Whenever, for example, we saw in the previous electoral campaign, you know, Elizabeth Warren talking about the possibility to fragment and to, you know, like um, reduce, you know, the power of the giants, um, we saw actually that it seems also almost a mission impossible, right? It seems almost impossible, but then we see that the European Commission is actually quite strong in enforcing antitrust uh, regulation. Now, this type of uh, fragmentation, in my view, is possible. And this type of regulation should be considered. Why? Because if we have a variety of developers that don't hold the same kind of power, then of course they become more accountable and they hold less powers also towards the policymakers. Like if you um, are interested in reading more about this topic, for example, the kind of lobbying that Amazon has done towards Brussels and uh, um, Washington DC, and I have a book on Amazon where I looked also at this context and the level of political power that they exert, you see that they incremental you know, um, progressively in the, in the last five years, their presence in crucial 
um, political community, right, in Brussels, in DC. Um, why they do so? Because they don't want to have this kind of conversation. They really want to avoid um, uh, having to be completely transparent. Now, um, we know that there are already international regulations that are starting regulating the kind of environmental harm that are in connection to the waste, for example. And even if you look the major uh, report that has been done, which has been used also by the commission uh, in the latest communication, you see that there is an acknowledgement of the problems generated by waste and the, the, the lack of ethics by the so-called global north towards the global south because you know the solution is always to dump our electronic waste but to answer also your question about are they responsible the problem is that in the, the way in which tech data colonialism works at the moment, um, the production of the Internet of Things and the AI powered application pushed by the profit making and the extractionism of the continuous data, data extraction of this type of system is of course creating an acceleration of the adoption of AI in all of these devices and all of these technologies, something that was not at the, um, conceivable even 15 years ago. And of course, because of this, it is perpetrating more inequalities and it is also creating more e-waste. If you look at the statistics of the projection of the, um, the development of e-waste is astonishing at the moment. So again, you know, um, we see an increase also of the production. Now, I'm always an optimist, so I'm always looking at the good news that are coming. And I think that the movement that also started in the US, now we see it developing in the EU, about the right uh, to repair is a very good point, you know, a good starting point in the right direction. Of course, it's still flawed, but we need to argue for, um, uh, you know, um, avoiding the kind of obsolescence, for example, that the kind of um, new devices are all carrying within. Because, you know, we have let this happen. It shouldn't have happened. You know, we can't afford this type of waste at the moment. We can't manage it. And it's harming the lands, the water of indigenous communities. It's harming the land, the water of the global south. So it's really not something that um, we can afford any longer. Um, if we, we want to keep going in the direction of more and more calamities. So again, there are ways to make these companies accountable. And I think that in the process of arguing for a green tech label, which is something that I'm arguing in the book, where we um, really um, measure every kind of, you know, the different kind of um, uh, um, like um, different departments and different um, section of the production and value chain, well, having all this accountability will help precisely in um, addressing these issues. So I think th this is why I think it's the way to go and it's promising. It is indeed, and ho hopefully all these policymakers across the world can bring this um, other part of their transparency, the sustainability phase of AI into their policy making and uh, making the value change actually transparent and accountable. Um, you spoke about a little bit about militarization and uh, there is a question from Willie the backer. Let's try to see if we can unpack that one. Um, he says, or he asks you, Benedetta, about uh, the current war and that is taking a central geopolitical stage and put of attention. Uh, he asks, will AI have more ne negative impacts on resources and the environment? Well, of course, like we know that this um, incredibly unequal and devastating war is uh, having a huge impact on the energy supply, huge impact on the uh, reframing of geopolitical powers as well. And um, I actually want to be um, on the, I read a lot of uh, debates and analysis on um, this topic. And um, I read a lot of um, commentators that were arguing, oh, this is the greatest opportunity to really move towards renewable. But, um, and this is the optimistic, of course, face of what's happening. The pessimistic face is that um, probably, you know, because of the lack of investments that have been done in the last 10 years, it's not as quick and it's not as a quick solution. But like, 
comparing you know, and considering these two different accounts, in my view, um, we, of course, were too slow in the uptake of um, the renewable that could have led. For example, if we think of Southern Europe and how it's lagging behind, you know, how much of the tidal energy, how much of the solar energy, how much of the wind energy uh, could have been used and adopted much earlier instead of, you know, the, 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 the incredible dependence on the gas coming from, from Russia and, you know, instead of reaching, you know, the, the limit situation that Europe is facing at this moment. Um, so, like to say, okay, do you think that the war, the war is a calamity? And I think that um, uh, it's difficult, right, to compare calamities. It's very hard to say, okay, is it is the climate crisis um, in, more impactful than the war? I mean, it's very difficult, of course, to raise these comparisons. I think um, that, like, managing crises is um, the job of good governance, good governments. And I think that during the pandemic what has been made very clear is that market solutions were not working. And we saw that the countries that have lost their welfare and their public health uh, tools were the ones that saw the biggest debt, they saw they had the biggest problems and the biggest debt toll. And similarly, I think that this is, is a crisis, is an opportunity to really rethink the role we want for the economy in the context of the green transition and the kind of society we want. Do we want to develop a society that is barely sustainable or do we want to develop a society, a society that thrives? I choose a society that thrives. And I think that um, the, the push that should come at this moment is not to take refugee, for example, to um, the easy solution of the so-called nuclear as transitional because you know, I'm someone that studies the power of magic discourse and talking about transitional for the nuclear is something that I can see emerging all around the world. Well, you know, let's not choose the, the cheapest solution that can be even more damaging for the, for the, for the planet, but let's try to really get together and, and, and find a solution. We know that the renewable are cheap at the moment and we know what they can achieve. So let's really try to, to consider this step and and uh, and find a communal ground i know it's not easy and i know that we shouldn't have been placed in this position and uh, um in which we are um so i also was reading your comment on the nova scene and of course you know love lock like you know, it's a, for someone that is fascinated by the history of technology is a must go book. But I can tell you that this type of imaginaries and this type of thinking around AI and the mythological thinking of, around technology has been so crucial in the developments of the kind of tech colonialism that we're witnessing today. Like Elon Musk has been a, an incredible um, a reader of Ursula Le Guin, for example. And you know, all these imaginaries are leading the men sometimes even to talk about the possibility to make Mars habitable by generating two different uh, nuclear reactions at the poles of Mars. You know, I don't think that actually this is the kind of um, immediate uh, social political uh, intervention that could lead to a more just society personally. So we have to be careful with those myths. Thank you for reminding us about the social construction of AI imaginaries uh, that are possibly migrating to the policy field in my view. But uh, anyways, uh, Benedetta, this has been a fantastic, really absolutely amazing webinar. And I would like to close it with one question. I would like to go back to one of your main proposals within your book, which is the green tech label. Something that for me can be very uh, natural and uh, normal to have nowadays. And still it seems like an imaginary for policy, but something I think that there is a possibility. So you push for a green tech label. What could be, uh, how would you sketch it? What would be the main elements? What type of indicators do you think we can embed in here? Just well, a, as a favor I think, for. I think it's, um, I think I would really um, divide, you know, the different steps of the green tech label according to the, um, the different phases that I highlighted of the production change of AI. 
Okay, so we start with the kind of extractionism. So we start with the minerals, the resources. Then we move into assessing the um, uh, computational power needed for the algorithm. We also assess the kind of um, data power that has been used, you know, the kind of data centers that have been attached to it. And then we end with the e-waste, okay? So the latest phase. Now, each of these phases, in my view, should have a green tech label. And how do we measure it? Right, because that's always the, you, the, the crucial question or also when we, we think in terms of um, the compliance checks, right? I don't think that we should just leave to self-regulation and just uh, you know to the company to self-regulate this aspect. I think that we will need a, because we have independent authorities in Europe, we created them, you know? So why not creating a network of, you know, authorities that will check for each of these phases. You know, we'll have the ones that will check the kind of minerals and resources. We'll have the one that will check the second step, the third and the fourth. And then we, we ask that anytime we are buying our next Alexa powered smart refrigerators, we will have the green label attached to it to know is it really something that is necessary for us to survive or is it something that maybe we don't even want to produce anymore because the idea that we have um you know a message in our computer reminding us that we don't have enough milk in the fridge if you know this is the kind of uh, service that we will need for us to thrive then we can consider let's keep producing if on the other hand, the kind of carbon emission, the kind of environmental costs are too high, we could decide, you know, to start, you know, listing in the high risk and the non beneficial applications, the ones that we believe are not environmental savvy, for example. So I don't see that this could be so difficult. You know, we, of course, see already the emergence of small um, high tech uh, um, companies that want to measure the phases, and we should, as you know, a society, push the developments of this, but keep accountability high because we can't have a situation where the biggest digital lords don't want to tell us about their sustainability. They don't want to tell us everything about the kind of computational power they use. They don't want to tell us about the fact that yes, they're using power and they're using solar panels, but they're also attached to the electricity grid of the local authority because they can't produce enough of that power. So we need to demand the kind of transparency that is useful to make an assessment because it's you know, through having this kind of information that we can make an informed assessment on what are the trade-offs for citizens. Fantastic, Benedetta. And I think that this uh, brings us to the end keeping accountability and sustainability high in the governance of AI is not only useful for governance itself, but also to make uh, assessments of what's happening at the consumer level, at the worker level, at any level. I don't think I see any other question, Benedetta. Um, I think we have addressed most of them, if you agree. Yes, I don't see others. So yes, I was curious, but yeah, I don't see the others. If you have, uh, if the audience has a very quick uh, um, uh, last question to Benedetta, now that she is in this side of the Atlantic, I mean, in European Central Time, she can answer that. Uh, I hope that we can have you again because this webinar has been so rich that we can make other webinars out of all your ideas that are uh, being uh, just expressed. And uh, well, I think that bring, this brings us to the end of today's episode. A hearty thanks to uh, to you, Benedetta Brevini, and uh, for being with us, and to you, the, our audience. I hope that uh, you have found today's episode interesting, fun, and compelling. Of course, thank you for tuning into our AI talks at ETUI. See you next time. Have a great summer. Goodbye. And thank you, Aida, for the opportunity. Bye. Are we off?